All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Illumine our hearts, O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge. Inspire in us also the glory of thy gospel teachings. Implant in us the fear of thy blessed commandments, trampling down our carnal desires, and enter a spiritual manner of living, while thinking and doing such things as well pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and unto thee we ascribe glory, together with thy Father, who is from everlasting, and an all holy, good, and life giving spirit now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Right. So, as I said, I'm going to talk about the hours. It's probably not going to take too long, but it's um there's some important things in here. So if you have a Holy Week book from the Antiochian Archdiocese, the newer version, let me just get through the orthros. There we go. Okay, so we get to page 451, 450, somewhere in there. 451. Actually, I could have sent you further along, but so the royal hours are a commemoration of four of them. It's a commemoration of important events in the life of Christ. One day, in fact. Now, notice it says here the royal hours of Great and Holy Friday. We know from history that Great and Holy Friday is the day of his crucifixion when he dies. Okay. So these hours have to do with the events that are surrounding his crucifixion and death. Okay. There are three of them. Now, the hours, you know, we have one of the craziest um, hourly schedules you can possibly come up with midnight is the beginning of the day. Why? Because I always figure it gets as dark as it can and then it gets brighter and brighter. I guess that's the only assumption I have, okay? Mm -hmm. um, well, that's not how these hours work, okay? <laughs> so when you hear the first hour, okay, and then you hear third and you hear sixth and you hear ninth, okay, well, ninth is about 3 p.m., okay? So ninth hour is 3 p.m., sixth hour is noon okay third hour is 9 a.m and first hour is seven. Oh, it's seven seven a.m yep because yeah, not zero hour so you only have two between first hour and third hour so it's seven o'clock then nine o'clock is third hour sixth hour is noon ninth hour is three a or three p.m okay now what does that have to do sunrise mm -hmm. Okay, it's the first hour of sunrise, second hour of sunrise, third hour of sunrise. Okay, mm -hmm. so it has to do with the rising of the sun. And then to make things even more complicated, in ancient history, in Judaism and in Christianity, the day began with sunset. Okay, that's why in the Catholic Church, you can have mass for Sunday in the evening of Saturday, because the rule is that the service for Sunday starts at sundown or six o'clock or however they set it. Yeah, that's right. Right. Father. Okay. Now that you're saying it. <laughs> and for us, it's Vespers. So we do Vespers is the first service of the, the church day for us in the Orthodox church. And that's also Saturday night for us. It starts at five o'clock. Sometimes sun sets at five o'clock. Sometimes the sun is like five hours away from setting because, you know, middle of summer, could be close to 10 o'clock before the sun sets. So, all right. So the hours have to do with certain things that happen during that time period. So I want to skip ahead. So you can see before we go too far, though, um, there are psalms that are read. And these psalms differ for each one of the royal hours. Now, for Great and Holy Friday, when we do the equivalent of the West Good Friday, we have three services that we remember during that day. The first service is, um, oh, well, and just so you know, in the Orthodox Church, we've already crucified Jesus by the time we get here, okay? He was crucified the night before. He was crucified on Thursday night. We have, um, we have a very long procession and reading service that goes on. Um, we read 12 different Gospels, right, during that time. And the priest comes out with the cross and brings it out to the center of the church. And then we put the icon of Jesus on the cross. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's Thursday night. 
So we'll not talk about that too much. But so that brings us into Friday. And on Friday, we have the hours, which are basically echoes of what just happened mm -hmm. the night before. We have Vespers, three o'clock. There we take the body off the cross and we place him in the tomb. And then we have the Orthros for Holy Saturday, which actually is on Friday night because <laughs> we're all confused. And at that point, we're all gathered around the tomb and we're singing songs of lament. Okay, it's pretty cool. So, so I, I mean, pretty cool. I, I mean, it's it's like awesome. In the church honestly. here, yes. Your service on Fridays at three o'clock, or no? Oh, or we have several. But okay, I mean, with with the the tomb yeah. and everything. When we right. remove the body right. from the cross, right. take him down on. Okay. The, that's Vespers of Holy Friday. Yeah, and that is that, and that's at three o'clock. Wow. Okay. See, okay. Father Sally's we were later. Okay. He did things. Well, we did the lamentation. See, the lament, the, the taking of the body from the cross. A lot of times in other churches have been combined into the service that comes later, that lamentations That's service. We did that. Okay. So the lamentation okay. service, we have the, the, the singing of sorrowful songs at the tomb. But then we also take that and we put it on what we call a beer, right? Okay. Which is for us, it's a flat surface where the cloth where Jesus is the icon of Jesus's body is, and we take that outside in procession, okay? okay? And as we go around the church, when we come back into the church, everyone goes under yes, that's the beer, the Greek church, yes. right? Yes. Goes under the beer, and that signifies our entrance where? Into Hades. I didn't know that. Okay, okay. because we're wondered. going with the okay. dead into the realm of Hades, where Jesus is destroying death by his death. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right? Okay. Now, see, this is something that's a little bit of a twist from the Roman Catholic, Catholic yeah. view, because for for forgive me, but a lot of what happens in Catholicism, and it's good that we're talking about the royal hours today, because that's a lot of what this is all about. The focal point is the crucifixion, big time, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. He dies mm -hmm. so that we don't have to. He dies so that the judgment against humanity is wiped clean, because through his death, God is no longer angry with us, no longer distant from mm -hmm. us but instead he's mm -hmm. our relationship with him is repaired okay, okay. <clears throat> that's not what we say all right in the orthodox church the thing that has to be overcome isn't sin it's death and so jesus has to go to hades and take all the people that have been collected that died before he died and pull them okay. out of that and take them into heaven and wow. that's what he does on holy saturday can I have a question? Yes, ma'am. Hades? Hades is the realm of the dead. <clears throat> okay. Okay. And mm -hmm. that's what existed before Christ died. He has destroyed the power of death through his death. We no longer have to worry about dying. Okay. Yes. What we do now is we repose. Our souls separate from the body. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. But that is just a mere we call it dormition. When we talk about how Mary dies, we mm -hmm. call it literally her dormition. But I thought she was taken straight to heaven. Body. Okay, that's so, not what we teach. That's uh, what you teach, but that's yeah. not what we teach. Oh, okay. 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 Mm -hmm. What we teach is she did indeed die because everyone has to die. Okay. okay. But after three days, uh -huh. she was taken bodily, reunited with her soul and is in heaven in that. But after three days, just like her son. Oh, OK, mm -hmm. because one of the apostles, again, according to Orthodox teaching, is Thomas. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And Thomas could not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. So he said, I have to put my fingers in your hands yes. and my yes. hand in your side. Well, because of his lack of belief, okay. when she died, he wasn't invited to be at her deathbed scene. Everyone else was taken by angels to be beside her. He was delayed in the three days that he was delayed. Uh -huh. See where this is going? Yeah. He goes and says, I want to see her. And so they roll a stone away and she's gone. Doubting she's not there. Us. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so he's given the gift of the resurrection of the mother. Okay. Yeah. Because he refused to believe in the resurrection of the son. Oh, okay. So we see her as with Christ in heaven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interceding mm -hmm. on our behalf. Yes. Pretty consistent with both uh -huh. traditions. But it was three days on earth first because we actually teach that she was perfect. 
Yes. She never sinned, ever sinned, exactly. never, ever sinned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We don't need an immaculate conception though, but, but we, we teach that her own decisions, her own life choices, her own ac ac actions, all of those things were never sinful. So she was perfect. And so in her death, she remains perfect. There's nothing that she needs to do to be perfect because she already is. That's Still not Jesus, yeah. but she's perfect. Well, that's why he picked her to be his mother. Yes. Yeah, we would say the same for that. Yep. And we also say that John's pretty close too. Jesus says that he's the greatest man ever to be born of a woman. Um, you know, in several places in the gospels, he says this, mm -hmm. right? So that's why many of our icons, you'll see Mary on one mm -hmm. of Jesus' side and John on the other side of Jesus on a oh. throne. Okay, we call that a triptych because there are three people in it. Jesus in the center, John and his mom. Yep. Okay, other questions or anything? And you can ask away. I mean, this this class is really intended to be an instruction. Okay, so it's really not, I mean, I'm using the mm -hmm. services as a way to kind of convey mm -hmm. what's going on, mm -hmm. but we don't have to follow the services. If we have questions that we want to ask, any of you want to ask, including all y'all at home, um, all you have to do is ask. I'd be happy to answer. So when I was at the Greek church, yes, naturally, Father didn't explain anything. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, well, you assumed so you knew. I know, and I did not know why we went under. I didn't have a clue. Right. I did not know. And well, no let's take it. We seem to know either. Let's take it one step further, I mean, or two steps further. Okay. So we go under, and once we've gone under, we are in the realm of the dead, which means the next divine liturgy we have, which is Holy Saturday morning, is in Hades. Okay. So the priest is dressed not in dark anymore. He's dressed in white because the Hades is where the resurrection begins. And we put all sorts of things like flowers and basil and all that mountain. Well, we use um, laurel leaves, bay leaves um, to signify mm -hmm. beauty coming to a very ugly place. Not that the church is ugly, mm -hmm. but Jesus coming and bringing life and light to this realm of the dead, which was saturated with darkness and putridity, mm -hmm. it smelled, it was horrible. Okay. And they were suffering. They were all tormented. And then Jesus comes and breaks free everyone from that torment. Okay. So that service mm -hmm. on that Holy Saturday morning. So this is before Pascha. This is before the greatest service of them all, but we're already celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. <clears throat> Just not in the same way, you know? pretty cool mm -hmm. so then we have that service after we've had that service then we gather again that night and what happens well we turn out all the lights right priest comes out with a candle says come take you the light which has never been overtaken by night come and um, glorify the christ risen from the dead and we go back outside and do another procession like we did the night before oh, wow. even though that's really like a three-day thing but we we do night after night okay and then we gather in the front mm -hmm. and we hear the resurrection gospel. And then the priest bangs on the door and reads a psalm, open ye gates, so you everlasting gates, the king of glory may enter in. And then some on the other side says, who is this king of glory? And then the priest responds, the Lord of hosts, mighty in strength, mighty in battle, he is the king of glory. And then we do that several times because we like to repeat. <laughs> but cool i mean interestingly enough there is a gospel not in the bible called the gospel of nicodemus and in the gospel of nicodemus you have the entire telling of jesus's time in hades it's as old as the bible okay and yet it didn't make it into the bible because it doesn't talk about every aspect of jesus or every aspect of what's going on we have a lot of gospels that exist mm -hmm. okay but only four made it into the Bible because they deal with specific things, the narrative telling of his teachings, his suffering, his death, his resurrection. Okay. Can I ask you a question? You can, you, yes. <clears throat> Obviously, I'm Catholic. Right? Yes. Why are there so like Orthodox Russian, Orthodox Greeks and Roman Catholics? And, and if God, if Jesus or God was a Jew, how did we all get all these other religions and all these other teachings okay well let's um i, I don't want to spear off of the subject no it's okay that's fine um so let's start with one thing now 
in mm -hmm. Newcastle, mm -hmm. there were ethnic Catholic churches. Yes. Okay. So you had the Italians in one. Uh -huh. You had maybe Irish in another. Yeah, I don't know. Right. You have Irish, mm -hmm. Polish in another, mm -hmm. and Germans in another. Yeah. Down in Pittsburgh, there was an English group. Yeah. You know, so you had all these different ethnicities yes. all under one church, right? Yes. Okay. Well, the Orthodox have that, except we don't have the unity of the one church. Oh. That's why there's a Greek Orthodox and a Syrian Orthodox and a Russian Orthodox okay. and a Serbian Orthodox, because they all come from those different homelands. Okay. Oh, okay. In Catholicism, you have all one Pope and he says, okay, knock it off. And, and what, okay. But what happens when you merge those churches? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you have a you have a bloodbath yeah, right I, yeah. you have an absolute bloodbath well what do you think would happen if we tried that same thing yeah, same thing, yeah, oh, yeah. Same thing. Right. you know i mean already we're dealing with you know i i hear people saying oh i wish we could do the beatitudes because in the russian-ish speaking churches uh -huh. in the orthodox world uh -huh. they do the beatitudes in the Greek and in the arabic speaking parts of uh -huh. the orthodox church they don't do the beatitudes OK, so, yeah, we get a little fussy, too, you know, and, and in, in my time, mm -hmm. in my time as priest here in Newcastle, which is whopping 13 years, we've lost two Orthodox churches closed. Yes. OK, mm -hmm. the Ukrainian church and the Carpathian Russian mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, they're both Slavic. All right. Mm -hmm. We're not. We're Byzantine. OK, mm -hmm. which means we don't do the Beatitudes. Oh, okay. All right. And which means our services are shorter <laughs> for many so reasons. Who's, who's right or who's wrong? Yes. Everybody and nobody. Okay. Mm -hmm. The problem is, see, in Orthodoxy, as in Catholicism, except for the Catholicism of, well, even Maryland. Maryland was the one colony in the United States when it was formed that was allowed to be Catholic. Okay. Its only problem was it was nestled right next to Virginia. And Virginia was militant, okay? Mm -hmm. So they would set fire to all the Catholic chapels along the Chesapeake Bay. Mm -hmm. And they would actually send people up into Baltimore and wherever else they were um, holding court. And they would threaten lives of people if they didn't stop being that wicked Catholic. Is that what they call the two cockpit? No, no, that's no. way later. Okay, yeah. okay. I'm that's sure. way later. Okay. That's actually after the Civil War okay. that that happens. <clears throat> um, but you, you have um, Virginia was extremely intolerant. And so what they would do is if you were Catholic and living in Virginia and they found out you were Catholic, mm -hmm. they would expel you. They would say, we're not really interested in that. Go to New England where the Unitarians are. So they shove you out of the state. Yeah. They could do that. Obviously they did. <laughs> this is, this is pre-constitution, pre-declaration of independence, okay. all of that. This is in the 16, early, you know, late 1600s, mm -hmm. early 1700s. Okay. okay? So there was Maryland that was Catholic, okay? Mm -hmm. But that's a specific flavor of Catholic. That's British Catholic, okay? okay? Okay. Well, then with, well, I mean, the Ku Klux Klan comes at around 1877. That's the next major immigration into the United States, okay? And that's where all y'all's mm -hmm. families came from, maybe later on. But 1877 was the beginning of the Eastern European and the Mediterranean in not persons, but journeys from their homelands into the United States. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's when you have Italian Catholics. And guess what? They didn't get along with the Irish Catholics. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> because the Italians are happy. The Irish were not. Okay. And they couldn't understand how you could have this difference. And so they couldn't, they didn't settle it in Europe. They had to settle it here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you have the Germans and the yeah. all those. And mm -hmm. so all of that happened in the late 1800s in the United States, along with us Orthodox. That's when we started coming onto the scene, too, for the most part. We had a presence in California mm -hmm. for over 200 years. We had a presence in Florida for over 200 years. Different, by the way. Greeks at St. Augustine mm -hmm. in Florida mm -hmm. and start with Alaska and work your way down into San Francisco, the Russians, because most of that, you know, there was a lot of connections between Alaska and Russia. Remember, Russia was sold to the United States around the Civil War era. Seward's Folly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were sold to the United States and they thought it was a great joke. Um, although now we know it's rich in resources and whatever else. So the joke's on them. Haha. -ha. 
but um, but that's a lot of the Russian Orthodox came through Alaska. Wow, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm into I'm into explaining how we get where we got. I don't care if it's science or history yeah. or mathematics or anything. I want to know why do we do what we do? Right. right. Okay. So in, in Newcastle, um, originally Newcastle was Scottish for the most part. Oh, I didn't know that either. I've and Italian. well, the Italians came, you know, with the industries, they would come into yeah. Pittsburgh, places yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they would get into the industries, the tin right. mill that was here, yes. Shenango yeah. pottery was right. here. Right. And the, hey, if there was work, people were right. here. Exactly. You had a lot of people going from New Kensington to mm -hmm. Newcastle for the same reason. We have family like Albert's family is originally from New Kensington area, Ford City, New Kensington. Oh. And then they settled here. Parts of his family settled here. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, like I said, I mean, part of this is understanding how you get to where you get. And so why I was bringing all that history up is mm -hmm. because say you're Italian mm -hmm. and you've got to go work in the mill. Mm -hmm. They hate you. Oh, yeah. Okay. We couldn't get jobs. In they, they think like, you're well. Yeah. And when you did get them, they were the worst jobs you could yes, possibly yeah, have. Yes, you would cool. melt literally yes. under the heat. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. You would have to take salt tablets to keep your, you know, your electrolytes your body, yes. up or you would mm -hmm. die mm -hmm. right there on the spot. And if a ladle happened to explode or pour out mm -hmm. or break or whatever, mm -hmm. you'd be the first one yeah. to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, which is horrible. I thought we got over that. Maybe we did. Um. <laughs> mm, yes, but no. <laughs> it's 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 the same but different. All right. Yeah. So getting back to the story, though. Okay. The churches mm -hmm. provided safe havens yes. mm -hmm. for the people that you know the Greeks. They needed a place where they could be authentically Greek. The, the Syrians needed a place where they could be authentically Syrian. The Russians, you know, and both, I mean, mm -hmm. and and the, trust me, the, the Russians are complicated, okay? Because they have the real Russians. Here they would call them hard Russians. That was the Holy Trinity Church that existed on a cheap hill, right? Mm -hmm. Until mm -hmm. the 80s when it closed. They spoke Russian or, you know, old yes. Slavonic, yes. Mm -hmm. all right? Um, you have the Ukrainians, okay? Well, tell a Russian that someone's Ukrainian and get and, and see what they will say to you. Yet is what they'll say. <laughs> They're us. That's why there's a war, okay, yeah. in Ukraine right now because mm -hmm. the Russians want the Ukrainians to be Russian, mm -hmm. and the Ukrainians want to be European. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, and then you have the Carpathian Russians. Oh boy. Okay, the church that closed down on Mill yeah. Street. Yeah. Okay, Mill Street and Reynolds, right? Well, the Carpathian Russians are neither of those two things. They grew up in the Carpathian Mountains, so they sort of border Russia. They sort of border Ukraine. Okay. But they're like Polish and Czech and and all those different things. But they still, you know, I mean, Russia had all sorts of influence throughout that whole area. And I'm not just talking about through communism. I mean, it existed long before that. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, um, he would kill me if I said it. I'm, I'm telling a family secret. But Tom Hopko, who is one of the greatest leaders of the Orthodox Church in America, okay, was Carpatho Russian. He would never say that, but he was. His wife wasn't, but her name was Schmemann, which means that she had Austrian connections. Can't tell her that either. Okay, so anyway, it's a long story to just say, look, the the idea of the churches is to give a sense of identity yes. okay well those days are over okay and in the catholic church they're over you know you can talk about your nice cute old customs we yes. can talk about our nice cute old right. customs mm -hmm. but all they really are is food for us at this point we don't care about the rest of that stuff that we used to do yeah no food is the same yeah catholic all we want is the food mm -hmm. <laughs> so yes now um they served they served their important important purpose okay mm -hmm. and and so that's why the differences exist that's why it's so profoundly different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right but it's it's like i mean think about when you were a child mm -hmm. okay um, slightly older than me so 
you had traditions in your family. Sunday would probably be some kind of dinner at a grandparent's house or something like that, right? Okay, well, does that happen now? No. Yeah. It happens with you. Does it happen with anyone? Well, how old are you? I'm not, I'm, no, that's okay. You don't need to tell me. All right, but your daughter, who's slightly older than me, right? She's not going to have that tradition because her sons will be somewhere else. Right? They come every Sunday. Yeah, well, that's now. It may, it, it may change. It probably will change. So, I mean, that's that's just these traditions go Right. When the children move out of town. And Newcastle is a, a great place to be from. Yes, I know. All right, so here we are. Um, so the traditions differ, and that adds to the complexity of it all. Now, we're not even going to talk about why the Orthodox and the Catholic aren't the same. That's a very messy story for another another time. <laughs> all right, but for now, let's go back and talk about what happens to Jesus on Great and Holy Friday. In the classes that I've been teaching, what I've been trying to convey is that our services point like half of them point to the groaning of of creation begging god to save us okay if you think of it even now war is is a fracture of humanity and there is nothing holy about it ever okay there may be just reasons for conducting a war but as soon as you lob something at someone else without knowing their face or knowing why they're there, you've you've taken a step beyond where God wants us to be. Okay, wars are inevitable. I'm not saying that you can't have wars. Mm -hmm. Okay, but they are um, they they strip away our humanity. They replace us. You know, we become you know dealers of death in a situation like that. Okay, now why I'm bringing that up is because, the, like I said, the world groans for a release from all of that. And that's what Jesus came to do. So in our Vesper mm -hmm. service, we have the telling of creation told through a psalm. And in that psalm, which is really, really beautiful, it has all the images, you know, how marvelous are thy works, O Lord, in wisdom, you made them all. Beautiful, you know? Mm -hmm. But then you get to what happens after that. The sun goes down, things get dark. It gets, you know, and creation, creation can't fix itself. So we need God to fix us. All right. Um, our Vesper service ends with the hymn of St. Simeon, who holds Jesus in his arms and realizes because he's held the Lord's Christ, he can now pass away. Lord, now let us all thy servant depart in peace, it says in Luke 2. According to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a face to enlighten the or a light to enlighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people, Israel. It's a beautiful hymn. And it's right there in the Gospel of St. Luke. Right? So that's the beginning of hope. The world's been groaning for this problem to be fixed, and the one who can fix it is here. Right? It's here. So then we have. Um, a service that's overnight. We talk about um, how we pray that we'll be delivered from the impulses and fantasies of Satan. I don't know about you, but the dark of the night will always lead, you know, I mean, think about Halloween. You don't have, you don't have a Halloween at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, yeah. you know? You have it at night when it's a little bit spooky and a little bit chilly and a little bit just dark, mm -hmm. you know? Well, that's that compline service. It's a, It's a service where we pray that God will Keep us free from all the fantasies of Satan. Compass us round about with your holy angels, so that guided and guarded by their watch, we attain to the unity of the faith and the full knowledge of your unapproachable glory. I mean, these are things that we say in these. And you can see it, you know, how we're just begging to have Christ come and help us. Okay, so then we talked the last times about Orthros. And so Orthros, in our tradition, is a service when the sun rises. Okay, and in English, the only nice thing about English is that when you talk about the rising of the sun, when it comes to our service of Orthros, you don't know whether I'm saying sun, S-U-N, is in the big orb in the sky, or S-O-N, is Jesus rising from the dead, because the image is the same. Oh. 
Okay, the image is the same. The sun rises, light comes yes. from the darkness. Okay, well, it's gorgeous, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we have that service, we are remembering Jesus's resurrection. Every time we have that service, we remember his resurrection through the fact that the sun is coming. Now, before I get too carried away with that, um, beyond that, let me also point out that Orthros is also, there's another thing that happens when something rises from the east. What would that be? The second coming. So not only are we thinking of Jesus's resurrection, we're thinking of his second and terrible coming. Okay, so it's a reminder of both of those things, it's a reminder of what Christ did for us, but it's also a reminder that he promised he's coming back. And when he comes back, we better look good, right? We better not be messing around. We better be ready. Okay, and that's what that service is all about. It's that combination of the resurrection from the dead, but also that we had better be prepared for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ because he's coming like, you know, thief in the night, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So those are the services that we've talked about so far and the images that are a part of that. Um, I have not made an, a, a tremendous effort to say that orthodoxy, I mean, what orthodoxy is, because for me, the reason why I'm teaching this class this way and trying to give these concepts this way is because orthodox literally means how to worship correctly. Orthodox, doxology, praise, glory, correct praise. That's what the word orthodox means. It doesn't mean I'm right and you're wrong. Although we would certainly have opportunity to discuss some of those differences. But the idea is that we orthodox Christians know how to pray. That's our mission is to pray. Because our Lord says, St. Paul says, to pray without ceasing. So that's what we do. Now, with all that said, then we go into the hours. So let's take a look. We're just going to act. We're actually going to look, open this book and look at something. In this royal hours, there are Old Testament readings, an epistle reading, and then the gospel. I want to look at the gospel. Okay. Because these are the royal hours. So as I said, the first third, sixth, and ninth. That means there are four of them. Can you think of something else where there are four of them? Gospels, right? There are four gospels. Mm -hmm. So each hour reads a story from one of the gospels. First one being Matthew, second Mark, third Luke, fourth John. Okay. All right. So I'm, I am. You want to read that? Could you read that loudly so that they can hear on the... No. At that time, when morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. When Judas, the betrayer of Jesus, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented, repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying... I have sinned in betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest taking the pieces of silver said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury since they are blood money. So they took counsel and brought with them the potters filled to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him who was valued, who was valued by the sons of Israel, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave them no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor wondered greatly. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And then they had and they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. 
So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For Pilate knew that they had delivered Jesus up out of envy. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much over him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the people to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And Pilate said, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took the water and washed his hand before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this righteous man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then Pilate released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe upon him. And plating a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat upon him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man of Cyrene. Cyrene, Simon by name. This man they compelled to carry the cross of Jesus. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mingled with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. That what was spoken by the prophet might be fulfilled. They parted my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priest with the scribes and elders mocked him saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cries with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, yeah. Lama Sabachthani. Thank you. That is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, and put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried again with a loud voice, and gave up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. And the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from afar who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Thank you. Okay. So that's the telling of the Passion Gospel from St. Matthew. Okay. What are we 
have in there for our purposes? Well, the time that he spent with Pilot and all of that, that was the first hour. Okay. That's about the time when he was mocked and scourged and beaten. So all of those sufferings took place at that point. Then the journey from that humiliation to his crucifixion took some time. Okay. Two hours, don't know. Okay. Now, one of the weirder things about this is how the different hours or the different gospel accounts don't really get the times the same. Okay. So you're going to find as we read other things, like the next gospel here, um, how things just, I mean, the, the, the details are different, but the important parts are the same. Okay. And that's an important thing for us. When we look at the Bible, and we're gonna, I'm going to talk about that as we wrap up today about um, what we use the Bible for, what it, it what it is meant to um, do for us, um, because I think, well, I think in America especially we have a place for the Bible that is not something the Bible itself demands. Okay, so with that in mind, we're going to go to page four hundred and seventy-two in your books. Did they, how did they actually kill him? I mean, what did they do? They crucified him. Yeah, well, how? Okay. I don't No, you're fine. Um, Because I, I was going to spend two weeks on this anyway. All right, so what did they do? Um, First thing they did to him, and they only, uh, forget it. Forgive me for how gross this is, because it's pretty gross. All right. The first thing they did to him is they scourged him. Now, um, in even in colonial days in the United States, they would give people lashes. Okay. So basically, you fashion a whip and you hit him. You hit him across the back and it hurts. And they would do that a lot to slaves. God help yeah. them back in the day. Right. <laughs> Scourging is slightly different. OK, scourging is taking that same lash and tying bits of rock and oh. bone fragment to the end of the whip. So that when you whip the person, those gashes are deep and extremely painful. And he got 39 of them. OK, 39 of them. Actually, I mean, I'm not a fan of Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, but he got that part down really well. <laughs> I mean, really well. It was, it, I couldn't watch the whole thing. It was beyond disgusting. Okay. It was, I cried. I mean, I'm, I'm, I do cry at movies. I'm a wimp, but um, yeah, that was that. Uh, wow. Yeah. How do you know it was 39? Well, it says it in the Bible. Oh, it says, it says 40 less one. Yeah. It says 40 less one. Wow. 39 times. Okay. That didn't so. Have not really. No, I mean, 40 is a very, very long time would be the like, uh, well, I'd put it this way. OK, I, I, I would put it this way. It is a euphemism. And what she just said is the right thing. The number 40 in all of the scriptures has to do with something having a beginning and having an end. And in this case, it's Jesus's life. OK, if he had received that 40th lash, he would have died. All right. So they kept him from dying by sparing him one lash. All right. That gives you even more sense of just how brutally horrible this really was. Yeah, this is not my favorite time of year. No. Because that I mean, was before they made him carry the cross up and everything. Right. They hung him on it. Now, remember, he couldn't carry the cross. They had to compel someone to carry the cross mm -hmm. for him, Simon of Cyrene, because he was in no shape to do anything. And if he had touched, I mean, if any of that, he, he would have just dropped. He wouldn't have been able to move. Okay. So. That's part one. <laughs> part two is, and this is something, you know, in the Orthodox Church, um, we use a cross that's slightly different than the cross that's mm -hmm. found in, in the Catholic Church. And the reason why is, you know, we have the three bars, right? I don't know if you can see that, but it's it's three bar with the Latin floral arrangements around it. But here, okay, you, you can take a look. You see how there's a bar at the top there's the bars where his arms would go, the long ones. Okay. And then there's one that's at a, oh, a, a diagonal. Yeah. Okay. 
So crucifixion. Crucifixion was meant to cause you to suffer. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. But for a long time. Because the crucifixion was not for you. Oh, you were going to die. But you were going to be in anguish for a long time. So that everyone who thought, well, maybe I'll do what that person did. will see you dying and say, there's no way I'm doing that. There is no way I'm going to steal or rob or beat or destroy or whatever. Okay. And remember, it was also done at the outside of the city, mm -hmm. right? So people are coming into the city and watching these people writhe in agony. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, there's no way I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in Jesus's case, though, he was so far gone that it only took a matter of hours for him to die. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go a little bit more into crucifixion for a second. The whole purpose of crucifixion ultimately is you die of suffocation. You don't die of the wounds. Oh. Okay, you're pinned to the cross. Mm -hmm. Forgive me to be so blunt. You're yeah. nailed to the cross, yeah, right? Yeah. But you've got a platform for your feet. That's what the platform at the bottom is oh, about. There's, part. Yeah, it's actually a platform. Yes. So it's mm -hmm. it's not it's not this way. It's this way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're standing on a platform with your arms outstretched mm -hmm. in pain. Okay. With your feet nailed. So your mm -hmm. feet are nailed to the platform. Yeah. Your mm -hmm. hands are out here and mm -hmm. whatever else. And they've got a sign above you that reads mm -hmm. what your charge is, why you're guilty of being mm -hmm. crucified, you know, why you are worth being crucified. So if you remember in the gospel of St. John, they say, well, it's almost the Sabbath and it's a holy day. So we want you to break their legs so that um we can take them down okay well when you're standing like this mm -hmm. you're not gonna die for a while you break your legs you have nothing to support your weight anymore so as you drop oh yeah as you drop it compresses your lungs and eventually you can't breathe anymore and you die <laughs> yeah okay mm -hmm. um and so then they say you know, they come to Jesus and he's already gone and they marvel he's already gone. And one of his soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately there pour forth blood and water. He who has seen his board witnesses, witnesses drew. Okay. The blood and water is the image of the wine mm -hmm. that becomes his blood mm -hmm. in, um, in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. So we have that Eucharistic moment where he pours out his life for us. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so that's that's probably all we need to talk about with respect to crucifixion. But you get the point, you know. Yeah. It's meant it's meant to cause agony. Now think of this, okay? Mm -hmm. Hundred years later, you've been found guilty of treason because you don't go to the Greek sacrifices. Instead, you are a Christian, and they say, "What are we to do with you?" And your answer is, "Please crucify me." I want to die like my Lord. Please crucify me. That's why we wear these around our necks. Think about it. Their chief instrument of torture and execution has turned into a life-giving instrument. <laughs> so no longer can they crucify people because it holds no weight anymore. I was like, yes, please crucify me. Yeah. Please. And by the way, kids, look, I'm being crucified. <laughs> Yay, dad. Go, dad. I mean, that's how it would be. It's exactly how it would be. See, you know, I can't wait for you to see Jesus, Dad. And I'm not being sarcastic. That's exactly what they would say. So that's the marvel of our faith is we took this instrument. Of tar I've used the image like imagine wearing an electric chair around your neck or a noose around your neck or a or a, a, a hypodermic needle now. Behind, you know, I mean, any image that would take away the, the 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 fear. I mean, Roman culture lost its its chief instrument of torture and pain. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's. <laughs> sorry, okay, I got carried away, but I answered your question. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point. That the crucifixion. How, oh, that was Norma's question about what happens in crucifixion. It's brutal. Yeah. Okay. okay. And and we we've had a lot of fracturing of history. So a lot of times now they'll have his feet like almost vertical. Mm -hmm. ah, now you can't support your weight like like that. You know they would you know forever it's been said that it was his hands 
and his feet. Well, now Bible scholars, because they have to say whatever, they insist that he was crucified through the wrist because the wrist isn't going to, if you get crucified here mm -hmm. and you're trying to support your weight, you're, it, the nail will just rip through your hand. But if you're crucified here, the, the wrist will lock you in. Well, they're still wrong. Okay, because mm -hmm. that's not the point. You're not supposed to die quick. You're supposed to die. Exactly. Yeah, after a long period of time. All right. You know who got that really well? I hated the show, but um, The Thrones. What was that? Game, Game, Game of Thrones. Thrones. They nailed, excuse me, not nailed. They did crucifixion pretty much like how it was done. Oh. I mean, that was the most nasty show ever. I, I I mean, I only see it through YouTube and even YouTube is gratuitous and it's violence. So, all right, so let's look at Mark. All right, so Mark is on page 472. And let's read this one together. Well, um, anyone else want to read? No, I think Deb does a good job. Go ahead, Deb. Yeah, I think so. you She's a good. teacher. She's got that teacher's voice. Yeah, yeah. she does. Read. Yes, please. At that time, the soldiers led Jesus away inside the palace. That is the praetorium, and they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and plating a crown of thorns, they put it on him, and they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck his head with a reed and spat upon him, and they knelt down in homage to, to him, and when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Okay, let's let's stop there for a second. I again, I know this is I'm getting gratuitous here, but I want us to understand what we're doing to our God here. Yeah. Okay. I mean, let's be real clear. <laughs> All right. They are humiliating him, and they put that crown of thorns on him, and then they hit him with what? What did they hit him with? A reed. A reed. Okay. He hit somebody with a hard yeah. thing. Okay. And it's going to hurt and probably knock them out. A reed is soft. All right. So what it will do is it will spread the blow from one side of the crown of thorns to the other. Okay. The whole thing. Oh. All right. So what it's doing is driving the crown of thorns into his head. All right. Don't you think he died way before he got on the cross? Well, yes. I, I, I think it was an easy matter for him to die because of everything that was done to him. Oh, yeah. Like Very clearly. Yeah. And again, I think Mel Gibson did an excellent job of that. Um, I think he got carried away with other things like the crows eating stuff and whatever. <laughs> All right. But um, that I, I just want us to understand, you know, the, the problem I have with us just reading it is that we read it to the point where we forget what it means. And I want us to really remember what it means. Okay. Mm -hmm. I want us to be mindful of just exactly. And what does he do in all of this? How does he choose to respond? This is God. If this was you, all right. And you had, if you were divine, mm -hmm. but didn't have his mercy. You would like had a human nature. How would you respond to this? You would send those Romans into the abyss. You would yeah, make them right. catch fire. Mm -hmm. You would make them turn into horrible creatures. You mm -hmm. would wish ill on them like mm -hmm. no one has ever done. And what does he do? He takes it. He did, yeah. Mm -hmm. He takes it. As they're nailing him to the cross, he says, forgive them for they know not what they do. But he takes it. Instead of just saying, okay, you guys are so bad, so horrible, I'm done with you, mm -hmm. we're starting over. No, no. He's letting us do to him what we do. Is that because of free will? Yes. It's not just because of free will, it's because he loves us so much. He wants us to choose him. He wants us to realize that we are better off with him than ever without him. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> okay? Mm -hmm. And so... Everything that he goes through here is so that we have the potential to be with him forever. And how does he put up with all this that's going on? But he does. Yeah. So because his mercy is way beyond our capacity to understand. And his kindness is way beyond our capacity. And, oh, by the way, his justice is way beyond our capacity to understand. We only have what we have, and those all of those have limits. Mm -hmm. You have limits mm -hmm. of how much 
abuse you'll take yeah, from right. somebody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at what he did. So in other words, should we take more abuse? No, no, but we should love God with oh. everything that we've got because he's our own, because we know if we leave ourselves to the same people that he was left to, we wouldn't fare as well, would we? No. No, but he did. So he teaches, he shows us the way of taking whatever it is that the world throws at us and just to go back to him. say forgiveness, forgive, yeah, forgive them. Boy, that's tough. Yeah. Right? But I just want us to understand this is our God, not just as he's a nice guy, Jesus, who is, you know, a carpenter son from Nazareth. <clears throat> this is the second person of the Holy Trinity willing to let his creation, the very crowning achievement of his creation, <clears throat> do this to him. Wow. Crazy, huh? Yeah, really crazy. From us it is, but mm -hmm. okay, so let's go on and read and then we'll be done for the day. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry the cross of Jesus. And they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mingled with, mingled with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And okay. the inscription... Just stop right there, just one second. Yep. The third hour that they crucified him. All right. This is, I think, the only gospel that says that. But that's why we have it at the third hour. Mm -hmm. Okay, why well, we have the hours at the third hour. So that's when we remember when he was crucified. Okay, go on, please. And the inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews... And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, he was reckoned with the transgressors. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who did destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priests mocked him to one another with the scribes, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried aloud with a loud, cried with a loud voice. That lama lama Eli Eli lama sabachthani, which means, "My God, My God, why has?" thou forsaken me and some of the bystanders hearing it said behold he is calling elijah and one ran and filling a sponge full of vinegar put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink saying wait let us see whether elijah will come to take him down and jesus uttered a loud cry and gave up the spirit and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and when the centurion who stood facing him saw that he thus cried out and gave up the spirit. He said, truly, this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger and of Joseph. And Salome, who, was, who when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered to him. And also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Thank you. Okay, so let me just say a couple of things and then we'll wrap up. All right, so t this one, instead of in Matthew, where it says the mother or the the the, the wife of Zebedee, or, um, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, it says Salome. Okay, so Salome and Zebedee are husband and wife. Salome is also mentioned in another book called the Proto-Evangelion of St. James. Mm -hmm. That's okay. where we learn that Mary's parents are Joachim and Anna. And we learn that Salome is actually the half sister of Jesus. Half sister of Jesus. Her son, John, is the writer of the gospel. Okay. A couple of other things. Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. I can't tell you what Lama Sabachthani means. Probably, why have you forsaken me? That would be my guess. Mm -hmm. Eli or Eloi is a... Um, if you think of names for God, Elohim is one of the names that is given in the Old Testament 
the god of the mountains. And we are thinking of our god when we say that. He's god of everything, so he's god of the mountains. So El something is generally god, all right? Elijah is god is the Lord. God is Yah. Okay? So our patron saint is, his name is just a divine name. Elias. Okay? What else am I missing here? So when they heard Elijah, they were just mishearing. Okay? That was um, that was not, I mean, of course, Elias would be expected, or Elijah, one of the same, um, would be expected to come at something like this because of the connection between the Messianic prophecies and at that time, it was believed that Elias would come back and meet out God's justice, because that's what he did when he was there the first time. But obviously, we know it's a little bit different than that. And then we'll talk next time about the curtain being torn in two. Okay, because so that's each important. Each one of them in the gospel, that's their interpretation. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and Dang. yeah, and so yeah. um this the seventh hour was the trial. The third or uh, seven o'clock. The first hour was the trial. Third hour is in this account is when the crucifixion begins, which means that he was on the cross for how long? Three hours. Six hours. Okay. According to the Gospel of St. Mark. Six hours. Okay. So it's still a long time. Yeah. But you could last for days the way they had it. You could last for days with him the way he was nailed to the cross. Yes. Again, that's the point. I mean, you you want them yeah, to suffer. You want to be, to suffer you're right? going to die of exposure. Yep. But they didn't so, break his legs. They did in the Gospel of John. When did they? Break oh no 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 they didn't. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. That is the right? various point. Not a not a bone upon him was broken. That's the whole point. It's the fulfillment of the scripture. Yes, not a bone was broken, but he was stabbed. Right. Yeah, sorry. Yes, you're right. So when he was stabbed, got carried away. any bones broke? Nope. No, no. No, right here. Oh. I'm cushy. <laughs> right there. <laughs> I'm glad you're cushy there. No bones in there. <laughs> just all soft. It's just a big old soft spot. And that, that, that's, where, that's where they think they got him, right here. So. Oh, wow. There's yeah. a lot of theories out there as to how he died and... Yeah, I, I, there are theories as to how he died, but I think, honestly, I think just given the level of torment oh, and yeah. torture that he was given, Goodness. it's kind of a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. um, when they say six hours that he was on the cross, yes. why do they say that then if they feel he died before that? Yeah. Oh, no, they do feel that he died in six hours. Yeah, oh. yeah I do. I, but they could, but what I'm saying is he could have died, yes, I mean, because earlier. of the way the crucifixion, crucifixion was Christ. done, yes. it could have taken a much longer time, days days because you're standing you're going to die of thirst or exposure yeah yeah remember actually they ran and gave him wine mingled with gall yeah right mm -hmm. so they want i mean that's that's giving them you know you, you die of thirst after what a day it's not long if you don't have liquid you die immediately yes yeah more or less if you don't have food, but you have liquid, mm -hmm. you can live longer. longer yes. yes, yes, yes. Okay. You can. Yeah. So um, I think it really has to do with how you understand the construction mm -hmm. of the cross. That's yes. That solves all the problems right there. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, I don't really, you know, again, for me, it's a theocentric point. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. point is that he went through all this agony mm -hmm. willingly. Yes. Okay. Without condemning us to a rotten horrible death and if that's the case think about the hope that we have mm -hmm. in the fact that our lord is willing to endure all of that for mm -hmm. us what mm -hmm. is you, you know, i mean us sinners there's hope for us yet okay and that's just how much he loves us and how much we should love him so so through all the torture in the world yeah that they are suffering right we are to see this but go to him we are to understand that yeah. in him they have first of all someone with whom they can identify okay mm -hmm. that their suffering and his are on the same i mean not the same level of right, course we're right, talking right, divinity right. here yeah mm -hmm. but 
he understands our anguish, our agony, our suffering. And if he doesn't, his mother does. Oh, God, yeah. Oh, right? Yeah. So between yeah. the two of them, mm -hmm. we have in, I mean, all of that enmity that existed before Jesus came, mm -hmm. all that separation and mystery and anger and wrath, mm -hmm. all that's gone. It's gone because we have a God who's willing to go through all those lengths to save us. So that's hard to understand, I think, sometimes. Um, I think it's harder to accept that than that to understand. Yes. I think mm -hmm. it's actually easy to understand. Okay. But harder to, but harder to accept. Mm -hmm. And especially if you come into it thinking, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a corroded, horrible sinner, you know, mm -hmm. totally corrupted. And mm -hmm. there's nothing, there's no good bone in my body and all that kind of stuff. This is, you know, I realize I'm a little hard on um, other faiths, but I really think that we need to, in the Orthodox world, emphasize the fact that we believe that people are born good, not bad. Okay, mm -hmm. we aren't born into sin. We're born into death. That's the thing. We're born into death born with original sin. Do you believe in that? We do not. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. See, yeah. And in fact, um, if are you are you thinking of coming back next week? I, I don't really. Have to be with you. <laughs> it's a lot. I know. Yeah. I mean, I love it. I it's a lot. I find it very interesting. I was raised with the catechism uh -huh. for the Bible. Sure. I know nothing about the Bible uh -huh. at my age. I'm not happy That's okay. to say that. That's okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you. But okay, I don't know. There's something about Jimmy this religion that's very interesting. Sometimes as a Catholic, I think they have a tendency to make you feel guilty. Well, yes, they do. And the only way that you'd feel guilty in our little thing is if you feel guilty because God did all of this for you and you don't care. That's how you'll feel guilty. Well, see, I was believed. I didn't believe. I wasn't raised to believe. Good night, Norma. Good night, Norma. Good night, Norma. All right. So let me, um, I mean, because there's there's a, a key reason why Catholics believe one way and Orthodox yeah. believe another. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with how we interpret Adam and Eve. What did they introduce into the world? Was it death or was it sin? We say sin. Right. But it was death. Sin is a Latin mistranslation of the Greek text. God bless you, Debbie. Good night, Debbie. Good night, Debbie. Oh, okay. Okay. Wow. Okay. It's a mistranslation and they know it. Yeah. Even Augustine. I mean, as far back as Augustine, he so you mistranslated mean the it. Today, they know. Well, I don't know if they know it because they've been learning Latin all their lives, not Greek. Oh. oh. Good night, Norma. Good night. Yeah. They the the passage is from Romans 5:12. And therefore, since through Adam and Eve sin entered into the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then on account of sin do we die, or there on account of death do we sin? That's the question. The way the second half of Romans 5:12 is interpreted. Mm -hmm. And for the Orthodox world, from the beginning, uh -huh. we have said that because death came into the world through Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. right? Because it's think about it this way: as soon as they eat the apple, they become aware that they're naked. Mm -hmm. And then God tells them all the bad things that are going to happen to them. So the result of their eating the apple mm -hmm. brings about death and corruption, mm -hmm. not more sin. See, we don't talk about death. We talk about the sin. Right. Then you are going to die. Right. Go to but you believe that you're going to, that you deserve to die mm -hmm. if you don't do something about the sin. So it's just so in reverse. So we take away at baptism. It's in reverse. Right. You take away the, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah. for us, baptism isn't that. Baptism is a second life. Okay, the first life is physical, the second is spiritual. So when do you get baptized in the Greek? Immediately. Yeah, so do we. 40 As days. Catholic. Yeah, 40 <clears throat> days. And then there's a question about, well, you should be baptized when you're older because right. you understand. Yeah, who cares if you understand or not? Do you understand your faith? No. no do I? No. no. Okay, so yeah, I'm not sure that really helps. Yeah. God is a mystery. I mean, you're and yeah. and why deprive people of sacraments? God bless you, Debbie. Yes, thank you Jeff, for making coffee. Oh, oh very interesting, yeah. Father. Okay, very. So I'm going to turn off the recording here for a second. So good night. Thank you very much for joining us, and I'll see you soon, God willing. Okay, so we have that. So we were.